Hello and welcome. Let's learn about the environmental loads in this lecture. We'll start by first discussing about its, its uh, definition and types, followed by snow, rain, wind loads and earthquake loads. So let's begin. Definition and types. Let's first define environmental loads. Uh, so as the name suggests, these loads are caused by the environment, right? There are four kinds of environmental loads acting on the structure. Snow, rain, wind loads and earthquake loads. Let's look at each one of them in great detail. Snow loads. In the colder states, snow loads are quite important. One inch of snow is equivalent to a load of approximately half pounds per square foot. But that, but that also depends on the snow density. For roof designs, snow loads can vary from 10 to 40 PSF. The exact number de depends on the slope of the roof and the uh, characteristic of the roof surface. Well, let's take, let's take an example. 10 PSF snow load can be taken for roofs having a 45 degree slope or an inclined slope while 40 PSF or greater can be taken for flat roofs. It's quite uh, intuitive, right? Look at these two images on your right. You can clearly see there is more snow buildup on the flat roof than on the inclined roofs. Hence, the load difference. I hope it's clear. So, snow is a variable load that may cover the entire roof or just a part of it. Snow loads depend on many factors, for example, geographical location, roof pitch, sheltering, or the shape of the roof, right? We just discussed. Chapter 7 of the ASCE 7 provides a great deal of information concerning snow loads. I will, I will attach the chapter with this lecture for your review. Rain. Rain loads often arise from ponding of water. Let's see what ponding means. If water accumulates faster than it drains off, ponding occurs. In other words, if the amount of water coming in is greater than the amount of water getting out, it will result in accumulation of water at one place. This accumulation is called ponding. This accumulation of water causes a sag on the roof, like, a, like in a shape of a dish which in turn will hold more water, resulting in even higher deformations of the roof. This can lead to failure of the structure. Right, so we need to prevent ponding. Some measures need to be taken, right? So for that, the best practice is to maintain a certain slope on the roof, preferably quarter inch per foot, and to provide good drainage facilities. Here you can see the image on your right. So there is accumulation of water on the roof. This happens when water accumulates faster than it is getting drained off. So this very phenomenon which you see in the image is called ponding. So at times in an event of a storm, the slope of the roof and drainage facilities are just not enough. The amount of water drained is significantly less than the amount of water entering from the storm. So what to do in, in that case? So to design for such situations, scuppers need to be installed in, in addition to existing drainage facilities. So, so now let's see what scuppers are. Scuppers are holes or tubes in walls or parapet. It acts as an emergency drain in an event of a storm. See this image to your right. You can see there are holes made on the parapet. These are called scuppers. It lets more water pass through the roof in a in very less amount of time. Thus, it helps prevent ponding in an event of a storm. You can find more information on rain loads in chapter 8 of ASCE 7, which I will attach with this lecture. Wind. This is my personal favorite. Wind is one of the most significant environmental loads. Wind is, is responsible for the failure of most structures. A structure is most susceptible to wind during its erection. Hence, a construction stage um, analysis is extremely important, which we will look into the coming videos. 
Now, look at the clip on your right. And yes, it is real. This is a classic and one of the most discussed failures due to wind. This is a Tacoma Narrows bridge in the state of Washington that failed due to wind loads. You can read more about it online. So let's move ahead. So wind loads are not uniform. They depend on a variety of factors like geographical location. Well, for example, Florida is subjected to extreme winds than probably any other state in the US. Next, we have height above ground. As you might have noticed, it is more windy at the top than at the base level. If you have visited the Empire State Building or any observation deck of a, of a tall structure, you will experience strong gusts of wind at the top. Right? Wind also depends on the type of terrains and proximity of nearby structures also affects the wind. Certain assumptions are made to calculate wind pressure. First, it is assumed to be constant, which is clearly not the case, right? And secondly, wind can come from any direction. So, considering all wind variations on the structure is next to impossible. A better understanding on how to calculate these wind forces is explained in chapter 26 to 31 of the ASCE 7. Well, as this, as this course dives deep into steel design specifically, we will not discuss on how to calculate these loads in this course. Maybe I will create more lectures in the foreseeable future where I discuss these topics in more detail. For now, you can go through the ASCE 7 and let me know if there are any questions. Earthquake loads. Many areas of the world fall under the earthquake territory and in those areas it is necessary to consider seismic forces in design for all types of structures. Have a look at this map. It shows regions that are most susceptible to seismic events. You can see parts of South Carolina, the, almost the entire state of California and Seattle are highlighted. The data shown on this map is taken from past earthquakes in, in, uh, in these regions. As we all know, earthquake is an acceleration of the ground surface. There are mainly two types of earthquakes on the basis of the direction of motion, horizontal and vertical. Look at the small clip to your right. You can see the three axes mentioned in the clip, X, Y and Z. You can also see the direction of propagation of the wave is in the X direction. The upper right clip depicts the horizontal particle motion as the particles in the wave moves in the XY plane. And the bottom right clip depicts the vertical motion as the particles are moving in the YZ plane. I know it looks a little confusing, but if you look uh, if you closely observe the y-axis line, which is this one, you will clearly notice the difference in, in the two motions. If you still can't spot the difference, let me know in the Q&A. Now, the vertical motion of the earthquake is of less significance and is generally ignored in the calculations. But, the horizontal motion is of great significance. So, earthquake loads calculated will generally be the effect from the horizontal component of the earthquake and not the vertical component. I hope it's clear. Now, AISC spec does not cover a lot about seismic load calculations. But there is another spec called the AISC Seismic Design Manual. Oops. Yeah, AISC Seismic Design Manual, as well as uh, in ASC 7. I will attach a few references of ASC with this lecture for you to go through. Well, that's it for this lecture. In the next lecture, we'll start discussing about the design methodologies. See you there.